It's a joy to share with you, especially in this particular time slot, because we come to the close of a series of presentations, but not to the end of the day. We really come to the threshold of a holy encounter that we are intended to share together and prepare ourselves for, and that is Eucharistic adoration. And so I deliberately chose for my topic, prayer in the Eucharist, as preparation for adoring Jesus in the most blessed sacrament. And I thought the easiest way to go about it would be just to take the, the, the prayer that we are most familiar with, the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer, and to look at it carefully, to examine it in each one of the seven petitions and show how Jesus gave us the most perfect of prayers and why it's always prayed by the Catholic Church after the consecration and right before communion, but always there at the climax of the Mass. Before I go any further, though, I would like to begin our time together in a word of prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, you are the creator of the universe and the governor of galaxies and solar systems. You amaze us with wisdom that is beyond all telling, with power beyond anything that we have experienced. And yet you have stooped down to us to reveal the face of our own Father in heaven. And we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. For it is through Christ, your eternal Son, and by the Spirit of his Sonship, that we have come to know and believe and experience what it means to be more than just your creatures, more than your servants or your employees, to be your sons and daughters, beloved children, and so in the name of Jesus, we pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit to rain down upon us again, to illuminate our minds with the light of truth, to enkindle our fires, to enkindle our hearts with the fire of your love, to help us and to hear us as we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, this prayer has been called many things. The Our Father, the Paternoster, the Lord's Prayer, the Model Prayer. It is certainly the most famous of all prayers, and it was delivered in the most famous of all sermons. The first sermon that Matthew records of our Lord, we call it the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. If you ever take some time and look carefully at this first public sermon of our Lord's public ministry, you see how it is that the Our Father comes at the center. It is the heart, it is the centerpiece of this sermon. If you back up and read the first four chapters of Matthew that lead us to the Sermon on the Mount, you'll notice that God is referred to as the Lord and the Savior, but only when you get to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 do you actually hear Jesus referring to God as Father, our Father, your Father. In fact, in this first of his public sermons, he addresses God as Father. He calls upon God as Father. He teaches us to recognize God as Father. He uses the word 17 times in just three chapters, which is more than you will find God referred to as Father in the entire Hebrew Bible, and that's just his first sermon. This is something that we often take for granted. People have told me, oh, you know, we pray that prayer too much. I don't think we do. I think we ponder it too little. And this prayer that Jesus gave at the heart of the Sermon on the Mount, Luke shows us that he actually gave it in response to a request that came from the disciples. Luke tells us, in fact, that it was Jesus praying all night long in this private vigil. When the disciples came to him in the morning, they realized that he had been up all night praying. And so what did they ask? Teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. I mean, John the Baptist taught his disciples. The Pharisees teach their disciples. Teach us to pray. And in response to that, what does Jesus say? Pray like this. Now, you might be tempted to assume that Jesus is just sort of like improvising. I mean, there, on the spur of the moment. He's, he's just pulled an all-nighter. 
And they're asking him to teach them to pray. You know, well, okay, uh, as best as I can, you know, here's an ad hoc prayer. But no, I want to propose to you that this prayer is not something that Jesus just came up with by improvising there on the spur of the moment. In fact, the very request of the disciples asking Jesus to teach us to pray, I suspect that that request was itself the answer that God gave to Jesus all night of prayer. Because we'll never be true disciples of Christ until we become like Christ. We'll never be like Jesus until we learn how to pray like Jesus did. So the very desire to pray is itself a result of Christ's prayer. And in this case, Jesus gave them truly what is the most perfect of prayers. Why do we call it that? The Catechism in paragraph 2763 states the following. The Lord's Prayer is the most perfect of prayers, for in it we ask not only for all the things that we can rightly desire, but also in the sequence that they should be desired. This prayer teaches us not only to ask for things, but also in what order we should desire them. So we all know that the Lord's Prayer is divided into seven petitions. And I suspect that seven is more than just an accident here. You know, seven we know to be a sacred number. It's not a lucky number. It is a sacred and a symbolic number. But what does it symbolize? Well, Jews understood because in the Hebrew language, the verb to swear a covenant literally was shiva. And if you look it up in a lexicon, shiva in Hebrew means to swear a covenant or to seven oneself. It's built upon the noun, the number seven, only you transform it into a verb. And so to swear a covenant is much more than a contract because when you make a covenant with a stranger, you've just sealed the bonds of sacred kinship. You now refer to that covenant partner as brother, like when Abraham and Abimelech swore a covenant in order to avert conflict. You refer to another person that you've just entered into a covenant with as spouse. But I mean, covenant is a sacred kinship bond that is based upon the deep meaning of this sacred number, seven. So the seven petitions, how are they arranged? They're divided into two parts. The first three we might describe as God word. Why? Because we're praying for thy name to be hallowed, for thy kingdom to come, and for thy will to be done. Thy name, thy kingdom, thy will. And then the last four, the second half, this is where we speak about us. Give us, forgive us, lead us, and deliver us. Notice the sequence. It's sort of like backwards. Because how do we typically pray when we find ourselves in trouble? And how do we start? By kind of crying out with our weakness, you know, why? Help me. But this prayer kind of tells us, you know, to avoid that sort of pattern. Why? Because the human tail shouldn't wag the divine dog. When we focus on the greatness of God, our Father, that puts all of our problems in perspective. When we focus upon the strength of God, we're going to recognize that our weaknesses are no match for his strength, that he is capable of doing what a father does for his children. And so this petition that we're going to look at first, hallowed be thy name, comes after a prologue. So let's just begin with the language of the prologue. Our Father who art in heaven. Before we even get to petition number one, what has Christ just done? He has just launched a revolution in the history of world religion. By teaching his disciples to do what not even the most devout rabbis did, in ancient Judaism, to address God as Father. Father in ancient Judaism was a metaphor, a figure of speech, something that we can compare God to. But ultimately, God is not really a Father. Well, that changed when God sent his only begotten Son. When the Father sent the Son, and together they gave us the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of Sonship, is what transformed her understanding of God. Notice that it is our Father who art in heaven, not our Lord, our lawgiver, our judge, the master of the universe, though God is all of those things, the one thing that Christ has shown us that is truly, truly a revolution in world religion is God's fatherhood. It is the ultimate revelation of God. 
And it is the ultimate solution to the ultimate crises that we face in our world today. Before he became Pope Benedict, Cardinal Ratzinger wrote, and I quote, the crisis of fatherhood, which we are living through today, constitutes the heart of the human crisis that is threatening us. Let me say it again. The crisis of fatherhood which we are living through today constitutes the heart of the human crisis that is threatening us. Here is a man who is never given over to exaggeration. He got it spot on. This is the crisis. This is the problem. But here is the solution. Why? Because if God is our father, then we are his family. We're not just creatures. We're not just servants. We're not just laborers or employees. He's more than a master, a creator, and a judge. His mastery, his judgments, his laws are all expressions of his divine fatherhood. And as our father, we know deep down that he loves us more than we're loving ourselves. He understands us better than we'll ever understand ourselves. And so what he legislates is not arbitrary, but it's designed to perfect and fulfill us. We can trust him more than we trust ourselves. And we can recognize in the face of a divine father our own true identity as a divine family. And notice, it isn't just our father, it's our father. We don't begin the prayer, father, or my father. This opening helps us to uproot the last vestiges of the kind of individualism that has not only seeped into the secular culture, but in a lot of the, the spirituality that calls itself Christian. You know, it's me and Jesus. It's you and Jesus. It's just a personal relationship between Jesus and each and every one of us as individuals. No, a personal relationship is what we have, but it's a lot, we have a lot more than a personal relationship. I can have a personal relationship, you know, with the garage mechanic who does my, works on my car. But this is a covenant bond of interpersonal communion that is truly a family tie. So it's our Father. So if God is our Father, then we are his family, and every time we pray this prayer, we ought to pray it as a member of God's family, whether we're alone or whether we're together. We should see ourselves as his sons and daughters, praying as brothers and sisters. But then let's look at the second half. Our Father who art in heaven. If God is our Father, then we are his family, but if he is in heaven, what does this opening line remind us of? If God is our Father and he is in heaven, we're not home yet. No matter how comfortable we might feel, no matter how much we might long, you know, to buy that home, to get that job, to settle down, to get that salary, to get that retirement package. If God is our Father and he is in heaven, then we're not home until we get to heaven. And everything else along the way is a pilgrimage. We're in exile. We are aliens. We're passing through. We're able to settle down wherever God calls us to, but we should never confuse it with our one true home. Our Father who art in heaven also reminds us of this, that God is not separated from us by light years. What separates us from God is sin, because sin is what snuffs out the sense of divine sonship. Sin is what obliterates the sense of God's fatherhood. In fact, John Paul put this, made this point very strongly. He put it at the very climax of his book, Crossing the Threshold of Hope. He described how for most people, sin does not cause us to deny God's existence. He said what sin does to us is it distorts God by transforming God, the Father, into a master, by transforming our own sense of identity as God's sons and daughters into mere slaves, the master-slave relationship is what takes over as a result of our sin. And so it is our sin that really causes us to be separated from God. And it's this opening line of this prayer that seeks to obliterate that sin that separates us. In fact, I would go so far as to say that if we really understood what it means to know God as Father, if we ever came to understand God's fatherhood the way Jesus, the eternal son, did, we could almost anticipate every one of the seven petitions. We could practically deduce them from the highest truth that is God is a true father. 
And before I look at the first three petitions, I just want to reflect for a moment upon this one more step, and that is God is eternal, but the creation is not. That's why it doesn't capture the highest truth of God to refer to him as our creator, our Lord, our master, because it makes God's identity dependent upon creatures, upon finite beings. But in fact, God's existence is utterly independent of creatures. So if God is not from all eternity a creator because creation isn't eternal, what is God from all eternity? And that's what Jesus alone has revealed by teaching us to say our Father. Because from all eternity, what is God? He's an eternal Father. It's more than a noun, it's also a verb. Because what is God doing from all eternity? He's not creating finite creatures. He is eternally fathering the Son. That's why we speak of the Son not as being younger than the Father or smaller than the Father, but God from God, light from light, true God from true God, precisely because he is eternally begotten, not temporally made. What's the difference between being created or being generated? Well, I've fathered six kids. We actually have now three grandkids, too. It's kind of exciting. But those kids don't look like me, not a single one of them. I think they all count that a blessing. <laughs> but, you know, if I ever got so dissatisfied that I just tried to, you know, I'm going to have a sixth child, and it's going to be a statue in the backyard that I'm going to craft out of bronze, and it's going to look just like me. Would that be child number seven? No. Why? Because it's made, not begotten. It doesn't have human nature. It has metallic nature. So what makes Jesus eternal is the fact that he is begotten, not made. From all eternity, God is eternally fathering the Son. And that's why the Son is co-eternal. So fatherhood means more than lording it over these younger or weaker and smaller beings. What it means to father is to take your life and to make it a gift of love from all eternity. Then the act of fatherhood is the dynamism of eternal love. And so the son must image the father's dynamic love by imaging him as dynamically as the father fathered him. So from all eternity, the son is imaging the father's love not only by accepting the gift of life and love, but by returning that life as a gift of love from the father to the son, but from the son back to the father. And what do we call that life, that gift, that love? Not what, but who? It's the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is the bond of this interpersonal love. Sure, it's a mystery that we never can really wrap our minds entirely around, but I can't think of a better use of our time here on earth than to contemplate this mystery of God's fatherhood and how it alone captures the truth of who God eternally is. Because the Trinity is the only God that exists, and the only thing that God is eternally is the Holy Trinity. This is the breakthrough that Jesus brought about when he taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven. Now let's look at the first three petitions. Hallowed be thy name. That's an interesting petition because it involves an old English word, hallowed. We don't hear it very often. I mean, okay, at the end of this month we're going to hear it, All Hallows' Eve, Halloween. But most kids don't even know what it refers to. We should, as Catholics, we know it refers to all saints because hallowed is the same as holy. And so we're praying, may thy name be holy. But that's a curious way to formulate the first petition because isn't God's name already holy to begin with? Do we actually think that we can make God's name any holier than it already is? No, of course not. Then why is it we start the prayer with this petition? hallowed be thy name. The catechism is very clear. The petition does not have a causative meaning. We don't cause God's name to become holier. So what does it mean? What it means is this, is that because God is our Father, we bear his name, because that's what children do. All six of my kids have Han at the end, and they know it's not an accident. And so if God is our Father, and he, then we are his family, but what is it that caused us to be made children of God. For when I was naturally born, I was the son of Fred and Molly Lujan, not the holy God of the universe. 
So when I was naturally generated from Fred and Molly Lou, I had human nature. But not until I am supernaturally regenerated through the waters of baptism do I enter into the family of God and become partaker of the divine nature. And why? Because I was baptized in the name of the creator, the lawgiver, and the judge. No. Wait. The Lord and the master of the universe. No. We're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This alone captures who God eternally is as the Trinity, as this divine communion of persons. Or as John Paul put it, a divine family. And so we are members of God's family precisely because we bear his name. We're not going to make it any holier than it already is, but the power of God's name is precisely what is going to make us holier than we presently are. That's the meaning of this petition. We're basically saying, Lord, do for us what we can't do for ourselves. You know, what can I do for myself? I can make myself a good neighbor. I can make myself a good citizen. But there's one thing I can't do, and that is make myself a saint. As Chesterton once said, be, becoming a saint isn't hard. It's just humanly impossible. <laughs> I can't even make myself a child of God on my own power, by my own name. But God has given me the power and his own name precisely through the waters of baptism. And so the Catechism states in paragraph 2839 that when we pray that his name be hallowed, we are begging God to make us saints. Pure and simple. And why are we here on planet Earth? For one reason, to become saints. Why did God make the world? Why does he govern it the way that he does? It's obviously not to make it more comfy and cozy for us on this side of eternity. The whole world, the way God has designed it and governs it, is one big saint-making machine. And that's the only way you can look at the world and say, you know what? It's working just fine. Because God is sending us so many situations where we have no way out except for God. And that's the key. To call upon the name of the Lord. Why? For our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And so when we pray, hallowed be thy name, we're saying, God, make us saints. It's not just make me a saint. It's make us saints. Together, as your sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, we stand together, we pray together. I love that line that Mother Angelica once used. She was interviewing a fellow who had two PhDs. And she just said, it doesn't matter how many letters you have at the end of your name. The only thing that matters is in whether you end up with two letters in front of your name, S-T. <laughs> and it's true. You know, I've got a doctorate. What does that mean? Diddly squat from an eternal perspective. You know, if, if I end up, you know, with this prestigious title and a professorship and prestige and money and fame and all of that, but I don't get to heaven, then every single second of my life on earth was a total waste. Whereas if I don't finish a doctorate, I never graduate from college. In fact, I drop out of high school. I can barely keep down a job. I'm struggling in every area of my life, but I make it home to heaven. Then every single second of my life was worth it. Because we're here to get out of here. We're pilgrims. If God is our father, then we are his family. If he is in heaven, then we are on our way home and we still have a ways to go. No wonder our Lord starts off with this petition because this is the one thing that matters more than everything else. Hallowed be thy name. Make us saints. And everything else will just follow just fine. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Wait, before I get any further, I want to just say something because, you know, Brant Petrie, you know, he always gets me going, you know, with all of that Old Testament background. Not that, you know, I needed him to help me. I had that problem a long time ago. But Brant has an article in our journal, Letter and Spirit, where he looks at the Lord's Prayer as an eschatological prayer of the New Exodus. And he pointed out to me that only really in Ezekiel 36 do you have the language that Jesus uses. Jot this down. Ezekiel 36, verse 23. Why? Because that's where the Lord announces, I will hallow my name. And then Ezekiel 24 and 5 goes on to explain how it is that God is going to hallow his name among all the nations. 
He's going to hallow his name. He's going to make it holy by sprinkling clean water upon his people. See, I wonder what that could refer to. Because when that clean water is sprinkled upon us, not only does he uproot idolatry from our hearts, but he gives us his own name. And then it goes on to describe how he'll take out the heart of stone and he'll put in a heart of flesh. This is what it means to be a saint, to have a heart for God, to have God's own heart. So it's hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come is a general reminder that if God is our father, then we are his family, but he is not just a father, he is a king. That makes us a royal family. That makes us more than just sons and daughters. It makes us princes and princesses, dukes and duchesses. It gives us a royal vocation. But notice it's a kingdom, not a democracy, not a republic. Why? Because we didn't elect God. We just hope he elects us. That's the way it is in a kingdom. That's also the way it is in a family. You didn't get to vote for your parents, did you? I didn't even cast a ballot for my siblings. If I had a chance, you know, it might have turned out differently. But in a family, as in a kingdom, God exerts his supremacy in a way that we must accept and submit to. And so thy kingdom come as a reminder that the order of creation has been set up by the king of the universe. And we should know this. And deep down, I think we do. When it comes to the material part of the world, physical matter, we understand that the laws of God are fixed. You know, they're inexorable. You know, if we heard next week about how, you know, Congress decided to debate the law of gravity, and then by the end of the week they, they voted unanimously to repeal it, you know, and the president decided to sign it into law. They all got together at the White House and the Rose Garden, climbed to the top of the roof to jump off to celebrate the repeal of the law of gravity. Don't clap. I knew you were going to do that, you know. <laughs> we need them. Pray for them, you know. God is using them in our lives like a chisel against the granite, the marble. What would they do? Would they break the law of gravity? I don't think so. They'd demonstrate it. Gravity would, you know, break whatever bones hit the ground first. Why? Because this is a kingdom, and the king has set up laws in the physical order that are fixed and unalterable. Well, guess what? The same thing is true for the moral order. The same thing is true for spiritual reality. For the life of the soul, just like the life of the body, there are laws that have been established by the king of the universe, and we pray for those laws to be observed, to be kept, and preserved, and we remind ourselves that from the very beginning, marriage was not a man-made institution. It was divine. And so no matter how people tinker with laws and redefine marriage or anything else, we know that it's like jumping off the roof to break the law of gravity. We're not going to break the law of God. We're going to violate it, and that violation is going to break us to pieces until we repent. Thy kingdom come is a reminder that we must submit, not only as sons and daughters, but as royal subjects. And only then are we going to be lifted up and exalted and empowered as his sons and daughters, as princes and princesses, to do what we could never do on our own. But there's another dimension to this petition that I want to reflect upon. Thy kingdom come, most people assume this is a sort of futuristic request. We can't wait till your kingdom comes, and there is certainly a lot of truth in that. But I want to propose to you that there is a reason why we all pray this family prayer together every week at one and the same time. No matter where we are, when do we always pray the Our Father? In the Mass. And when in the Mass? After the consecration and right before Holy Communion. And why? It isn't accidental. It is very deliberate and significant. Why? Because the kingdom is not just futuristic, it is also Eucharistic. We should have known that as Catholics because deep down we know that wherever the king is, there is the kingdom. But wherever the Eucharist is, there is the king. So what do we pray at the end of the Our Father? Drawing from 1 Chronicles 29, for the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours but only at the end of time. Oh, wait, that's not what we pray. What do we pray? The kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. 
Whoa, that's right. And why? Because the Lord of Lords, the King of Glory, is present, veiled under the appearance of bread and wine. But faith grasps what our physical vision cannot see. And that is not Jesus' battered corpse bleeding on the cross, but the resurrected, ascended, enthroned Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And he comes to us by stooping down to us in our weakness and hiding his glory. But that glory is present, even though we can't see it. And if, if we're lucky enough to be alive at the end of time, we may be in for a shock because he's not going to have any more glory at the end of history than he has right now in the Eucharist. The only difference will be that we will have caught up to that glory and possess it ourselves. Until then, we can't behold that glory without burning up and shriveling. It's just too much for us to take in. And so Christ keeps us from seeing what we could not assimilate and then feeds us. And so it is that when we pray, thy kingdom come, guess what? That petition has just been fulfilled. And oh yeah, by the way, how do we begin and end the Mass? By making the sign of the cross and by reciting what formula? In the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sanctifier? No, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's because in the Mass, God is using his name to make us saints. And God is giving us the king to usher in a Eucharistic kingdom to establish his reign in our lives more than anything else we can do on earth. And so we pray, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thy will be done. Now this is one of those tricky petitions that we have to reflect upon for an extra moment or two because you know, a lot of people wonder, does it really make a difference if we pray or not? Because, I mean, God is God, and he already knows the future. He knows whether I'm going to be healed or not. He knows whether I'm going to keep a job or lose it. I mean, why bother praying if God already knows the future? I mean, prayer is not going to change God's mind. Well, if you're praying to change God's mind, do the rest of us a favor. Stop praying. <laughs> I don't mean to be too blunt here, but... Let's just ask ourselves a question. Whose standard is more reliable, my mind or God's mind? My will or God's will? Do we pray to change God's will? No. This petition is a general reminder of the truth that matters most. We pray in order for God to change our will. We pray for God to change our will by conforming it to his, by making our mind to think his thoughts after him. And why? Because we recognize that not only does he know us better than we know ourselves, he loves us more than we love ourselves, but he allows things to happen to us, not in spite of his love, but because of it. This petition is really captured nicely by St. Therese, who said in the story of a soul, she boasted, she wrote, God gives me whatever I want because I want whatever he gives. That's the heart of a child. That's the trust of a beloved daughter who knows that she ought to trust God's will more than her own. And she unites her will to God's will and wills what he wills because he's willing it. And he is more reliable. That doesn't mean we can't open up our hearts and share you know, the deepest concerns. If anything, it really frees us to pray like our Lord did in the Garden of Gethsemane. What does he do? You know, He implores his Father, Abba, Father, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, what? Not my will, but Thine be done. So we can pray, you know, whatever is on our hearts, and we should. In fact, what is the only book of the Bible that consists entirely of prayers? What is the longest book of the Bible and the only book that the, prayer, that, that the church prays 24-7? The Psalms. Not a New Testament book, but an Old Testament book. There are 150 Psalms. I love teaching this graduate course that I've taught on the book of Psalms. And in the process of teaching it over and over again, I was kind of surprised to discover that approximately 42% of the 150 psalms are what scholars describe or characterize as psalms of lament, or most scholars prefer to call it psalms of complaint. Why? Because that's what the psalmists do. They complain to God. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, I don't. I would never think of complaining to God. I doubt that, for one thing. But I think the real problem is that we confuse complaining with murmuring. 
Murmuring is what Israel did in the wilderness for 40 years. They weren't complaining to God. They were complaining about God. The psalmist turns that around, and he offers these prayers of complaint directly to the Lord God before the face of the Almighty because these are the prayers of a child who trusts his father. Let's face it, you don't complain to someone unless you trust them and unless you think they're going to be able and willing to do something about it. And so the church prays the Psalms 24-7. Why? Because this is where David, a man after God's own heart, discovered the heart of God and showed it to the world. God wants us to discover ourselves as his children by going to him as we can approach a father. And i got to tell you, I've got six kids from 26 down to, to 10. And throughout their lives, and especially in their teen years, they felt that filial freedom as children to complain to their father. <laughs> Sometimes it got a little out of hand. But early on, they discovered I wasn't afraid of their complaints. In fact, I welcomed them, especially when they expressed a trust in me, that I cared, that I was able to do something, and that I would do it as soon as I can. But again, Deep down, we have to recognize that the reason why we pray is not to change God's will, but for God to change our will. Only then do we discover how prayer can change everything, except God's will. But what prayer does, by uniting us to God's will, is to empower us to affect change in every area of our lives, in every relationship, in our home, in the neighborhood, at, at work, wherever we are. When we unite our wills to God's will, we unite our weakness to God's power. And he's able to do more through our prayers than he can through our actions. You know, I've said this before, and I've heard many others say it too. You know, oh, all we can do is just pray for her. You know, as though if we could actually do certain actions that they would be much more powerful than our You know, I would say the most we can ever do for people is to pray for them if we really are praying to unite our hearts to God's heart and for him to release his power in our weakness. And believe me, God wants to do that more than we want him to. That's why he put these petitions on our lips and in our hearts and asks us to pray them as a family. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. And then what? On earth as it is in heaven. Look at the Greek and you will see that it's actually literally as in heaven, so on earth. As in heaven, so on earth. And if you look carefully at the structure of the Lord's Prayer in the original form that we find it in Matthew 6, you're going to find that this phrase doesn't simply apply to the last petition, number three. In fact, the church's catechism makes it very clear that this particular phrase is sort of the hinge on which the whole prayer turns from the three petitions to the four, right? Thy name, thy kingdom, and thy will, then give us, deliver us, lead us, and you know, deliver us. So it is that this, this part, this phrase, as in heaven, so on earth, pertains to all three of the first petitions. Hallowed be thy name. May thy name be holy, as in heaven, so on earth. Thy kingdom come, as in heaven, so on earth. Thy will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. But that sort of raises the question, what is it like? For God's will to be done in heaven. Well, we don't really have to guess a lot because God gave us a book of the Bible. In fact, it's the very last book of the Bible, and it reveals to us what it's like for God's will to be done in heaven. And it's the book of Revelation. And I remember reading that and rereading it and trying to get my mind around it and just giving up. I even translated the entire book from the Greek into English, and I still couldn't get it. Not until I actually went to my very first Mass as a Protestant observer. And that's where I heard things that at first I didn't recognize until the people began to chant all around me, Lamb of God who takes away this, and then Lamb of God who takes away, then Lamb of God who... And then the priest elevated this host and said a fourth time, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The people were on their knees, but I was at the edge of my pew thinking, Lamb of God, Lamb, four times in less than a minute, and I knew where I was, in the back of the Bible. Because that's where Jesus is called many things, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, Alpha and Omega. But the one thing that he's called there more than all the other things, and the one thing that he's called there and nowhere else 
is Lamb of God. Lamb of God. 28 times in 22 chapters, and the technical term is used for him as the Passover lamb. And I never understood why. Nobody had even claimed to explain why. But I'm turning to the back of the Bible, looking down and seeing Lamb of God, Lamb of God, Lamb of God, and suddenly I see the holy, holy, holy Lord. You could take it. God of power in my... Revelation 4, verse 8, the holy, 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 the Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God, the Amen, the Alleluia, the Hosanna, the glory of the Benedictus. You won't find anywhere in the entire apocalypse the term Antichrist. You won't find anywhere the term rapture. You won't even find the phrase the second coming. What do you find on every page of the apocalypse? The liturgy of the angels and saints in heaven described precisely in terms of what we share on earth as it is in heaven, and where do we go in order to do God's will like that? In the Mass. The Amen, the Alleluia, the Gloria, the Lamb of God, the Holy, Holy, Holy. And what else does John describe in these visions of heaven? He describes candles, seven of them, the menorah that stood by the altar in the Jerusalem temple, only it's in the heavenly Jerusalem. Not a man-made temple, but the divine temple. And what is Jesus wearing? A long white robe. It's a liturgical vestment. And there are 24 presbyters, elders, priests. And as you continue reading, you see the altar with seven chalices that contain wine. When they're poured out, John describes how it's become blood. Any of this sound familiar? God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven more perfectly in the Mass than anything else we do. No wonder the Catechism states, and I quote, in paragraph 2770, in the Eucharistic liturgy, the Lord's Prayer reveals its full meaning and power. In the Eucharistic liturgy, the Lord's Prayer reveals its full meaning and power. And no wonder, because God's will is being done on earth as it is in heaven. We don't have to die in order to go to heaven. All we've got to do is attend Mass And heaven is where we are. The angels and saints are who we're with. Their songs, their prayers, their sacrifice are one and the same as ours. And what power and grace we release whenever we go and we know it. Whenever we unite our will to our Father in heaven and the angels and the saints and the martyrs and the mother of God. We've just gotten through the first three. We still have four more to go. Let's look at the next one and see if it can relate in any way to the Mass or the Eucharist. And what is it? Give us this day our daily bread. Once again, we see something tied to the Eucharist. But let's look first of all at the term give us. Because the Greek tense is imperative. It really is a demand. Give us! Whoa! Who do you think we are here? Demanding of the Lord God of the universe our daily bread. Well, if God is our Father and we are his family, then this is what we can reasonably expect and request and even demand. Give us, forgive us, lead us, deliver us. All of these are in the imperative tense. These are the demands that little beloved children can rightly make of an almighty God who is also a loving Father. But notice that it is give us, not give me. Gimme, gimme, gimme. You know, like the way some children sometimes approach the parents. This prayer uproots the last vestiges of our individualism, especially here. But also notice that it's give us this day our daily bread, not steak and lobster. Right? Because, I mean, God makes us his sons and daughters. He calls us to be saints, and he doesn't want spoiled brats. So he gives us what we need, not what we want. And there's a huge difference. And so what we're basically saying here is that we are your children. You are our Father. Give us not what we want, but what we need. Give us this day our daily bread. Not this year's supply. Not my retirement plan. But give us this day our daily bread. Because as children who trust God more than we trust ourselves, we can be content in a very reasonable way with what we need for today. But look at this again. Give us this day our daily bread. This day, daily. Isn't that a little redundant? I mean, Jesus, just economize. 
give us this day our bread. Or give us our daily bread. Well, why does Jesus, you know, stretch it out? Give us this day our daily bread. Because he was a Jew. And he was talking to Jews. And where do Jews go in their minds and memories whenever they hear about God giving his family each day their daily bread? In the desert for 40 years, what did God do? He was a father waiting on his family hand and foot. He was giving them the manna. But how much did he give them? Lots. But how much were you supposed to take? Just enough for the day. And if you took enough for the next three days, by the next morning, the rest would have spoiled. Except on day six, there was a little miracle there. Because on day six, you could take twice as much as you needed because there wouldn't be any on the Sabbath. And would you wake up on the morning of the Sabbath and have the manna spoil like the other days? No, for some divine reason it didn't spoil. So you learn how to rest and trust in God your Father. Give us this day our daily bread is a reminder of the manna that God gave to Israel in the wilderness, but it's also a reminder of the true manna. What does Jesus speak of in John 6 after multiplying the loaves, feeding the 5,000, and filling 12 baskets full? He talks to them all about how he is the true manna, the bread from heaven, like we read about in Psalm 78 that God gave them each day. It's the bread of the angels. Only now it is the Eucharist. So when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, when does God do it? Well, throughout our meals, but especially in one sacrificial communion meal, the Eucharist. And I'm not just making that up. In fact, if you look carefully, if you look closely at the word Jesus uses, give us this day our daily bread, the Greek is epiousios. It gives translators fits because it doesn't occur anywhere else earlier in ancient Greek literature. And so it's sort of like, okay, what do you mean by this? Give us this day our epiousios, our daily bread. Well, daily is a, a proper translation. But the more carefully you analyze this Greek word that doesn't occur anywhere else earlier, or it's a, a hot pox legomenon. That's what scholars call it. It doesn't occur anywhere else. When you look at it more carefully, you realize it's a compound term. Epi, usios. Epi is a prefix that can mean over. It could be translated super. The word usios is easily translated precisely as essence or substance, like homo usios. Only epi usios, if you want a really literal translation, Look to Jerome. What did St. Jerome translate this in the Latin for the Vulgate? Give us this day our supersubstantialum, our supersubstantial bread. He's not reading much into that. He's just translating it quite literally. Epiousios quite literally is supersubstantial. Now what kind of bread do you suppose Jesus might have been talking about? Or thinking of. I mean, wonder bread, right? It builds bodies in 12 ways. At least I heard that as a kid. No. This is the bread of life. This is the bread of heaven. This is the Holy Eucharist. Because wherever the king is, there is the kingdom. And wherever the Eucharist is, there is the king. And he has come to feed his royal family. To give us this day our daily bread. The Catechism puts it so well in paragraph 2816. Quote, the kingdom of God has been coming ever since the Last Supper, but in the Holy Eucharist, it is in our midst. The kingdom of God has been coming since the Last Supper, and in the Eucharist, it is in our midst. The kingdom has come. The daily bread has been won, and we are fed with a bread that goes beyond anything we can know from this earth, anything we can receive from our earthly fathers. So give us this day our daily bread has a deeper meaning that is also preparing us to welcome Jesus in the Holy Eucharist and to celebrate the bread of heaven, the bread which is given for the life of the world. Now we come to petition number five. It's my least favorite. It's forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. What's so funny? You're going to tell me you like this petition? I don't think anybody really cares for it. I mean, if, 
if I had had the delete key back then, I think I would have pressed it and just, you know, let's shorten it, make it easier to memorize. Forgive us our trespasses. You know, and if you insist upon adding that last part, okay, forgive us our trespasses, and we will do our best to forgive those who trespass against us. Or just change that one little word just a little bit, forgive us our trespasses, and we'll forgive those who trespass against us. But it's not a conjunction, and. It's an as. And that's a scary thing, because Jesus seemed to be fond of using that term. Where else does he use it? Be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. Luke 6.36. A new commandment I give to you that you should love one another as I have loved you. Ooh, man, he has just raised the bar. What are we really asking for here when we're asking God to forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass again? Let's look carefully at this phrase, forgive us. Who are we talking about when we pray forgive us? We're basically saying forgive us Catholics, right? No? Would we include non-Catholics? You know, as as St. Thomas said, all people are children of God, at least potentially. Some have actualized that potential, but all are potentially God's children. So when we pray, forgive us our trespasses, who is left out of that? No one. That's right. Okay, so if the God of the universe, if the almighty and all-holy Lord of lords is not only willing to forgive us, but actually dying on the cross to make it possible, just who do we think we are to withhold that same forgiveness from people who have hurt us? Well, God has his standards, but I've got mine. You know? That's stupid. That is self-destructive, and the consequences could be eternally catastrophic. We can't afford to have higher and holier standards than the almighty and all-holy God. And if he was not only willing, but dying to forgive us, and we are sincere in praying, forgive us, not just me, but forgive all of us, and nobody's excluded in that term, us, then who is left over for us to withhold forgiveness from? Well, you don't understand what my wife has done. You don't understand what the boss just did to me and my coworkers. Well, I don't. You're probably right. But God does better than you do. And he's not only forgiven you, he's forgiven them. And he died to do so. And so he is challenging us to grow up as his children because he doesn't just want us to be sons and daughters. He wants us to be what? Saints and not spoiled brats. Not selfish, immature children. So he really meant it when he said, pray, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. But I think there's a deeper lesson that is to be learned and an even more important lesson. Because the more I pray this prayer, the more I ponder this petition, the more I keep coming back to the same discovery that God wants me to hate my sin more than other people's sins. And to be honest, I don't have any problem hating sin, especially when other people commit it against me. I I have the holiest hatred you can imagine for those sins. My problem is my sins. This petition is a gentle but firm reminder that we can't afford to hate the sins of others more than we hate our own. And no wonder, because the sins that other people commit can't take me out of heaven and lead me to hell. Only my sins can do that. So I have got to hate my sins more than your sins. Especially, especially the sins that I commit the most and enjoy the most because they're the ones that can do the most damage for all eternity. So when we're praying for God to forgive us, we're really asking God to heal us by taking sin out at its source, which is this pride, self-centered self-regard, where we trust ourselves too much and God too little. And I want to propose to you that you need to really reflect upon this if you have trouble forgiving your parents, if you have trouble forgiving a priest for what he said or did. Because God has used my parents to bring me life and love, food, clothing, and shelter. And believe me, 
I kept careful track of all their faults. And I know better than anybody my mother's failings. But God reminds me, nobody on the planet is going to do as much for you as they did for you. If you can't love and forgive them, then nobody else is safe around you. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Because when we withhold forgiveness, we short-circuit the electricity of God's mercy. And by the way, how does this relate to the Mass? We call it the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And what does the sacrifice of the Eucharist do? It is a sacrifice for sin. Granted, it is not intended to be received by those who are in mortal sin, and they know it, but they haven't confessed it. But what is the ordinary sacrifice that God has us offer to obliterate our venial sins and all of these disordered attachments to these worldly pleasures that could keep us from eternity? It is the Eucharistic sacrifice. So where does God scrub us clean? Where does God weed our garden? Where does God uproot the sins that we commit the most and enjoy the most because he knows they'll do the most damage? Through the Eucharist. As St. Thomas Aquinas reminds the church continually, we can only receive the Eucharist beneficially if we have the disposition to holy love. It's one thing to receive the Eucharist sacramentally, but as St. Thomas says, we only feed spiritually upon him if we receive Christ in the Eucharist with the disposition to love as we've been loved. And so it is that in the Mass, through the Eucharist, especially in our Holy Communion, God is forgiving us of our trespasses and empowering us to do what we could never do on our own, and that is forgive others as we have been forgiven. And then the next one follows. Lead us not into temptation. Why does it follow from the previous petition? Well, I would say because most of my temptations arise because of my refusal to forgive those who have trespassed against me. My temptations to sadness and depression, my temptations to anger. You know, I remember Clyde Naramore writing a book on Christian counseling saying, you know, a lot of people are out there giving you keys to happiness, keys to success. He said, I want to give you a key to feeling miserable. Just really think a lot about what you think other people owe you. Just dwell on that for a while. And in no time, you will be miserable. Why? Because we never get what we think others owe us. But when we look at what we owe God and how little of that we gave and how he turned around and forgave us, or as one writer has put it, Christ paid a debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. If Almighty God has used his eternal wealth to forgive us, then we had better forgive others, and we will find in the process we will have been delivered from almost all of our temptations. But this petition goes a little further. Lead us not into temptation. You know, when we hear this, we might be thinking, why do we even pray like that? Because, I mean, God is not in the business of alluring us, hey, you know, look at this forbidden fruit. God doesn't entice or seduce or tempt. And the book of James makes it very clear in 1.13, let no one when he is tempted say, I am tempted by God, for he tempts no one. In the sense of enticing, seducing, or alluring. But what God does do is wrapped up in the word parosmos. That's the term Jesus employs. Lead us not into parosmos, which could be more precisely translated the test or trial. Lead us not into the test. Lead us not into the trial. Now, why would God ever even think of testing us as his sons and daughters? Well, I know why I test others, because I'm a professor and it's part of my contract. Just last week we had midterms. I tested all of my students to find out what they had learned from me and what they hadn't. Turned out pretty good. But I didn't know until I tested them. But that can't be why God tests us, because it isn't as though God is up there wondering what we've learned. God knows it better than we do. So why does he test us? Why does he allow us to undergo trial? Not to find out what we don't know, or I'm sorry, not to find out what he doesn't know, but precisely to show us what we don't know. When we face tests, when we face trials, we discover, I'm not as strong as I thought I was. 
I discover that my weaknesses are greater than I realized. But in the process of God showing my weaknesses, why does he show me my weaknesses? In order for me to discover his power and for me to desire it much more than I have up until now. But as James says, you have not because you ask not. Why wouldn't we ask? Because we don't think we need it. Why don't we think we need it? Because we're basically content thinking that, hey, I've got the power, I've got the means, I can do it on my own. Well, that is the first step to temptation. And Paul reminds us of this in 1 Corinthians. It's one of my favorite texts. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. We have a famous saying that's derived from that. Pride goeth before a fall. But Paul continues, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. And the word he uses, parosmos. No trial, no test, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. It's kind of like a, a sober reminder. You know, because sometimes we face problems where we're like, nobody has known the troubles I've seen, you know. You know, we're not that unique. You know, God sends us problems, but problems like everybody else has. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. But they didn't stop there. He goes on to say, God is faithful and will not let you be tempted beyond your strength, but with the temptation will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. What comfort, what reassurance that is, that no matter what trials we face, God will always provide the way of escape. No matter what temptations come our way, he'll show us the way out. But what is Paul talking about? You know, just this Monday, I was driving out to St. Vincent's in Latrobe, got about 11 miles of turnpike. You can kind of really, you know, take it up to 65, 70, 75. I was going up to 80, 81, 82. And then, as I was tempted to give into like 85, about a mile and a half ahead on the hill, guess what I saw? Two red bubbles, and I saw him before he saw me. God provided the way of escape for that temptation. But I don't think that's what Paul's talking about here, you know? But what is he referring to? Well, most English translations just leave it at that. By the end of verse 13, there's a paragraph break. And in fact, in my English translation, there's not only a paragraph break between verse 13 and verse 14, there's a subheading suggesting that he's changing horses. He's introducing a new subject in verse 14. But with the temptation will also provide the way of escape and you'll be able to endure it. Stop, get a drink, come back, start reading. There's a new subject. Except for one thing. He begins the next verse, 14, with the word, therefore. Therefore, my beloved. Now, that's not how you introduce a new subject. That's how you draw a conclusion from the previous subject. And Paul's a very logical thinker. Whenever he uses the word, therefore, you need to ask what it's there for. Because he is drawing a conclusion, logically, based upon what he said. But listen to the conclusion that he draws about the way of escape that the Lord will provide. Therefore, my beloved, I'm speaking as to sensible men, judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Well, yes, yes Paul, that's the Eucharist you're talking about here, but you just kind of zigged when we thought you were going to zag. You just kind of changed horses midstream. You were talking about God providing the way of escape in order for us to endure all of our trials. And then suddenly he introduced a whole new topic. The cup of blessing, which we bless, is it not a participation, a communion in the Greek, koinonia, in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a participation, a communion in the body of Christ? Is Paul really introducing a new subject? Or is Paul unveiling the way of escape that God provides all of us so that we can successfully endure whatever trials we undergo? Why? Because the body and blood of the resurrected Lord of Lords is the same body that underwent crucifixion and the scourging and the spitting and all of the abuse out of love for us. He was dying for the very people who were killing him. And Our Lady was not only forgiving them, but giving consent to becoming the mother of the murderers of her only beloved son. That isn't hard. It's just humanly impossible. 
That is what we receive through the Holy Spirit in all seven sacraments, but especially in the most blessed sacrament of the altar. For in the Eucharist, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a communion in the blood of Christ? Christ's body and blood strengthens us in our weakness. It shows us light in darkness. It shows us that there is no human escape. There is a divine way. And that's why this petition is answered in the Mass after the consecration and right before Holy Communion because God is not only leading us out of temptation, but he's also delivering us from evil. Deliver is a strong word. Why? Because it represents a victory, a conquest. But we're not saying, God, we can do it ourselves. We're basically saying to God, we are in over our heads. We face a foe that we cannot conquer. We're no match for the devil, but he's no match for our father. And it's important to notice that this petition, deliver us from evil, is not just generic evil. There's actually a definite article in front of the term for evil. Literally, it is deliver us from the evil one. Why? Because Christ is reminding us that if God is our Father and he is in heaven, that we're not home yet, and we face the world, the flesh, oh yeah, and the devil. I know a lot of you know, my colleagues in the profession of theology you know, think it's really sophisticated not to believe in the devil anymore, just like the devil wants them to do. But whether they believe it or not, our Lord Jesus not only believed it, but taught us to recognize that we are facing a foe that we can't overcome on our own, but we don't ever need to be on our own. We aren't just creatures left to our own devices. We are children who have a Father who is in heaven, and he sent his Son in the form of the Holy Eucharist to strengthen us in our weakness, to deliver us from evil. Notice the petition does not say, deliver us from suffering, from illness, from unemployment. There's a place and a time to pray like that, but the petition that Jesus put upon our lips is deliver us from evil. Why? Because sickness and suffering, illness and unemployment, these are often the chisels God uses against our hard hearts made of marble to make us saints. The only real enemy we have is sin. And we trace it back to its source. We trace it back to the world, the flesh, and also the devil, and we're reminded of what Jesus said. Greater is he that is within us than he that is within the world. Almighty God and his Holy Spirit, he is within us. We're no match for the devil, but the devil is no match for the almighty God and his Holy Spirit. And where do we find God conquering evil? Where do we find God delivering his people from the dominion of darkness and the power of the devil? Turn to the back of the Bible and you'll see it all in the book of Revelation. That's where the devil is thrown out of heaven. That's where the demons you know, are, are cast out. That's where the wicked crawl into the caves and cry out, rocks fall on us and deliver us from the lamb. Have you ever seen a killer lamb? And it's almost like Monty Python. What are they talking about? The killer lamb. Well, the fact is, God's judgments that the book of Revelation reveals are released against the powers of darkness. But each and every single time God's judgments are revealed and released against the devil, it is always and only in direct response to our prayers, to our songs, to the sacrifice, to the holy, 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 the Lamb of God, the Amen, the Alleluia, the Gloria. So where does God release his power to deliver us from evil more than anything else that we do on earth? in the Mass. When we sing the same songs that the angels and the saints and the martyrs sing, when we join our prayers to the Mother of God and to the Archangel Saint Michael in Revelation 12, then and only then do we experience the true deliverance that is not human but divine. That's why I would propose to you that we have not prayed this prayer too much, though we may have pondered it too little. This is one of those prayers that is deeper than the ocean. It is inexhaustible. It is the most perfect of prayers, especially when we pray it in the most perfect and blessed of sacraments. 
In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen.